Dave Gulson is professor of biology at the University of Sussex, specializing in the ecology and conservation of insects, particularly bumblebees. Gulson is the author of several books, including Bumblebees, Their Behavior and Ecology, Silent Earth, Averting the Insect Apocalypses, and more than 200 academic articles. In 2006, he founded the Bumblebee Conservation Trust, a charity that aims to reverse the decline in the bumblebee population. Professor Gulson and I discussed, among other things, what lies ahead for the world if insect declines continue. And guess what? Would it be worse for the planet to lose insects or humanity? It's great to meet you via internet, but in person, maybe any time in future. Professor Gulson, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. You know, uh, for this special occasion we are meeting, I have a bottle or cane of cider. <laughs> I think it should be all right to celebrate it for you. <laughs> I, I, I should have got, I've just got a cup of tea, unfortunately, but I, I should go and get some of my homemade cider. So, well, this is not just handmade, but uh, cheers. Cheers. You are a cider lover, is it right? I, I make my own cider. Uh, yeah, I've, I've planted lots of apple trees in my garden, including some old kind of heritage cider varieties. And uh, yeah, every autumn I... I got a big press and uh, have a, a couple of days squashing apples and squeezing the juice out and getting it all fermenting. It's good stuff. How big producer you are? How many liters per year? Maybe? Oh, uh, yeah, not that big. Uh, a couple of hundred. Um, it, uh, it, it's only really for me. So, <laughs> so it would be dangerous if I made too much. You know, I like very much uh, the impression of just Uh, honorable professor of University of Sussex and to see just an ordinary gentleman just digging somewhere in a garden and preparing his own <laughs> cider and I'm thinking about if it works like that that maybe your friends even maybe colleagues from university they say oh you know Dave will come so probably he will bring some cider or anything does it work <laughs> like that <laughs> I, I am sometimes asked to bring my cider to parties yeah uh, they, they know it's it's a cheap way of getting lots of booze so uh... Uh, and I, no, it's not to everyone's taste. I, some people think it's a bit um, sharp, a sort of rough. Uh -huh. But I, I, I it's maybe a slightly acquired taste. But some of my friends love it. All right, I have your books here. I have uh, Jungle in a Garden, uh, Silent, Silent. Earth. How to? How, how, how was the original name, please? Silent, Silent Earth. Silent Earth. Here's the audio book and. Uh, the Czech name is Return of Bumblebees, but I think the original was Sting in a Tail or something like that. Is it yes, right? Yes, Sting in a Tail. I guess that that uh, play on words doesn't work in other languages, unfortunately. So you are professor of biology, but you are keen on gardening and on uh, on the life that is just happening or uh, growing uh, in the parks, gardens, and small grass places. Is it so? Is it right? Sorry, what was the question? I... Uh, I'm asking uh, that on one side you are keen on gardening, yeah, and on the other side you are just fascinated by the jungle that is just on every garden in parks, yeah, just yeah, small kind of countryside. I, absolutely, I, I, I mean, and I think the two, you know, go hand in hand. I mean, if if you're, I, I love my my gardening is about trying to provide homes for more wildlife really that's I, i don't i don't care too much what it looks like i'm more interested in what creatures i can persuade to come and live there so um it's about growing native wildflowers and uh and and being kind of gentle and untidy um uh having lots of ponds and piles of sticks and compost heaps and uh of course no pesticides And I just love being outside and, you know, today was like the first day of spring. It felt like here, gorgeous sunshine. And the first few insects starting to appear, I saw a bumblebee, mm -hmm. uh, which is very early. Um, but it's just, it's just for me, the, the insects are, and, and the wildlife is kind of almost the most important part of a garden. You know, having a sterile, neat garden with a plastic lawn and the, uh, just, what's the point as, as far as I'm concerned, but I know I'm probably a bit weird. I like it very much, your approach, because I think that uh, a lot of my friends who are just hardly working on their garden, they don't count it as a nature. They count it as a garden. It should have some order, 
special manners and special habits they don't uh, don't count it as a as a real nature but as i read your books i think that you recognize the nature there the real jungle there and it yeah, should be I, the, 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 i mean they there can be thousands of species in in a in a garden which i think most people have no idea and and they could really help you know we, we're in a sadly in a biodiversity crisis you know with species going uh disappearing faster than they have for 65 million years so i think it's it's like it's really empowering that we can do something as if you've got a garden even a tiny garden you know if you if you, if you invite in kind of nature to to live there um i i mentioned in in one of my books this little garden in leicester which was owned by a uh, a lady called jenny owen who spent 35 years identifying everything that she could find every every bird every plant every insect and so on and her species list after 35 years of looking in a, i mean a little tiny urban garden uh, was 2673 which is amazing i mean you know that that's I, more than i would have guessed you'd find in a little bit of rainforest you know it's uh and i think that's really inspiring to think that we could literally have thousands of species in our back gardens without really doing anything that's at all difficult you know the first material that i have uh, read from you it was just a jungle in a garden and it starts to fulfill me with the optimistic view of uh, of the nature of a uh, of the temporary state but then i continued with a silent earth and it makes me it 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 just throw me uh, through me to the to depression and i think yeah. it probably shows the way once the, once the scientists start to work in garden it definitely leads to some some results and uh, your results uh, from your gardening are quite sad i'm afraid yeah i i recently got a, a an email from a total stranger who'd who'd just taken for some reason he'd just read all my books in chronological order um from sting in the tail which was published 10 years ago uh, to silent earth and and he seemed genuinely concerned about my my mental health <laughs> <laughs> your books are just getting darker and darker you know because the the first one is very light and celebratory and about the joy of, and the fun of studying bumblebees and how interesting they are with only a little bit about con conservation um uh and obviously silent earth is 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 much darker and is is really focused on this crisis and i think that that does reflect you know a growing realization in 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 my mind but also uh, more broadly but you know of the severity of what's happening you know when i started studying bumblebees 30 years ago i wasn't doing it because i was overly worried about their their conservation um it was just i thought they were interesting and i i studied their foraging behavior and kind of esoteric aspects of their biology just out of curiosity really It was, but then over time i realized they were disappearing and and so my kind of career changed direction and became much more focused on understanding why insects are vanishing and what the consequences are and what we can do about it um i should say that silent earth does attempt some positivity towards the end um it, it, you know i it, it, there's a lot of sad statistics in there but there's also a lot we can do and i i you know i i i'm hoping to shock people into getting involved in taking action to you know make their garden more insect friendly try and campaign for more environmentally sustainable systems of farming voting for green politicians and and doing all the things that we need to do to to make the world a better place um obviously it's, it's a, they've got a long battle ahead so let's keep your procedure please start and scare us a little bit by some uh, statistics and some information well i i think the severity of this first struck me um when when i was invited to to help a, a german group publish their results which were based on insect trapping on nature reserves across germany um when we published the results in 2017 uh basically what they found was that the the sort of 
the the weight, the biomass of flying insects on German nature reserves had fallen by 76% in a 26 year period uh, from 1989 to 2016. Um, we, and when I saw the data, I couldn't quite believe it. But, you know, we went through them and looked at them from every angle and there was no, you know, no explaining what the data what the data showed, other than three quarters of the insects had disappeared. Um, now since then, there have been lots of other studies on other insect groups. Um, some of them even more terrifying. Some of them slightly less so. Um, butterflies in the UK, for example, which are a quite well studied group, they've roughly halved in in population since I was. Since 1976, when I was a kid running around with a butterfly net chasing them, um, uh, I, the, the more most there was a, most, a very recent estimate from the UK which suggested that um, insects in the UK are declining at about 34 percent a decade. Uh, it doesn't take many decades at that rate, and there's not going to be anything left. Um, and it, also, uh, an aspect of this that we don't often think about is that. These declines, we're probably just measuring the end of the decline. Um, you know, we don't know exactly when they began because we don't have any data going back um, before about 1976 um, for any insects. But the things that we know are driving the declines started at least 80 years ago, probably 100 years ago. Um, so, you know, the German data showing a 76% decline. Well, actually, the, the total loss of insects is probably much bigger than that. But mm -hmm. we, we don't have we don't have the numbers. But that, you know, gives pause for thought. If 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 three quarters is an underestimate, then what is the true figure? And, you know, how much have we got left? Um, and, and of course, I suppose the real question is what's going to happen next? Is this are we going to allow this to carry on or are we going to do something to stop it? This is the point. Uh, some friend of mine, when they see an insect, they just by reflex kill it. And <laughs> you know, you know uh, yeah. many people doesn't like or are scared by an insect. Any. I, I, I know. And it's, it's a source of endless sadness to me. Uh, uh, it, it's a really clear phenomenon. You know, children on the whole like insects or it's very easy to to get them fascinated and they they love to hold them in their hand and and look at them maybe keep them and feed them and give them a name and uh, um but by the time they're teenagers or adults they, their behavior completely alters and they they become frightened anything buzzes near them the immediate reaction as you say is to is to try and kill it um and i guess it's it's a learned behavior from from older people i guess it's perhaps partly lack of opportunity to to handle insects to learn to love insects um most of us live in cities most of us don't see many insects um apart from perhaps cockroaches and houseflies um, which aren't the most endearing of insects um whatever the reason I, it's really sad because it you know obviously we should appreciate insects. They're amazing. They're they're fascinating. They do really important stuff that we need them to carry on doing. So I, I find it really sad that, that people have that attitude. And, and I guess, you know, my sort of mission in life is to try and win them over and persuade everybody to love insects, which is uh, is 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 I've got a long way to go. But you know, I, I find it's a, I find it's a very interesting and I uh, I like your approach to insect and it opened me new spaces how to think about insect and let's start to talk about it because uh, on one hand I would say uh, if all the humankind will disappear I don't think it will be too bad for the planet earth and on the other hand if the insect will disappear something will happen uh, yeah, I, I mean, absolutely. And and, and that's more or less a, a, a quote from E.O. Wilson, who's an American biologist, insect expert, sadly died last year. Um, but I, yeah, it's undoubtedly true. I mean, if if, if mankind were to somehow vanish, um, the world would, you know, the rest of biodiversity on our planet would do very well. It would recover quickly. Um uh, and and diversity would, would within a few thousand years it would be as if we'd never lived um 
but if insects were to disappear basically the planet would grind to a halt you know they're 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 kind of like the 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 oil that lubricates the whole system they're, they're involved in all sorts of ecological processes you know they make up the bulk of species on the planet about 70 percent of all species are insects and as an aside it's, it's thought there are three four five million more that we haven't even discovered yet which is amazing um, but anyway that they, they are most of biodiversity they're food for a huge number of larger creatures that perhaps people care more about like birds and uh bats and so on um but then the more importantly really they 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 do all sorts of things like recycling cow pats, dead bodies, dead trees, leaves, and so on. They recycle the nutrients, which is really important and helps to keep the soil healthy and they control uh, crop pests and they distribute seeds. And all of that goes on without anyone really being aware of it or thinking about it at all. Most people never consider what happens to a cow pat when it comes out of a cow. <laughs> Um, but but what happens is important nonetheless you know it has to be recycled the only thing that people do understand i think to some extent is pollination that people people appreciate bees they think that they pollinate everything and they have a very simplistic understanding but they do at least i think most people are aware that we need pollinating insects because they pollinate our crops and that's the most obvious link to our well-being but there are lots of others and and you know to cut a long story short um, our lives would be really tough if we somehow were to lose most of our insects. You know, f- the food supply would be much reduced. Millions of people would starve. Um, it would it would be a pretty grim future. So we really need the insects to be here to, for us to be alive. We and... do. I, so those people, your friends that squash insects, you know, <laughs> they need to understand that these insects they they may not love them, but but they should be thankful to them because they're really important how can we help insects to uh, if not grow in numbers just to slower the extinct yeah i i mean there's lots of things we can we can do some probably more effective than others i mean the the easy thing is to if if you're lucky enough to have a garden to, to come back to to gardening um you know it, it's it's quite nice because it's kind of empowering you know grow a few wildflowers stop mowing your lawn so much don't spray any pesticides really simple things and and you will see hundreds of insect different species of insect in your garden maybe thousands as we talked about earlier um and there are a lot of gardens in certainly in europe they come you know um i don't know the 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 figure for other countries but in the uk there are about 22 million private gardens And they cover us about 400,000 hectares, uh, which is collectively a big area. And imagine they were all insect friendly, wildlife friendly. Mm-hmm. That would mm-hmm. that would help. It would be a big step forward, and it would help also not just to help the insects, but it would help people to connect with nature because they'd ha- they'd be surrounded by it. It would be in their garden, in the local park, um, along the road verges, or wherever. Um, So that's good, but unfortunately, urban land is really quite a small proportion of the world, um, uh, and farm farming is a much bigger issue and harder to change. Um, but there there are changes afoot in the world of farming. You know, we've gone down this avenue of very intensive agriculture with bigger and bigger fields, monocultures, lots of chemical inputs, fertilizers, and pesticides, which has made farming pretty hostile to to all life really um and i think there's a growing realization that that's not really sustainable long term that it's doing too much damage it's, it's undermining its own basis by damaging the soil causing climate change wiping out biodiversity so it's losing pollinators and so on that it relies upon um and and so there are um farmers sort of um trying to do things differently exploring what's sometimes called regenerative ag- agriculture ecological intensification is another word that's sometimes used but essentially trying to combine food production with uh sort of sustainable soil management and encouraging pollinators setting more land on the farm aside for nature to ensure you've got healthy populations of natural enemies and so on and more broadly in europe the farm to fork strategy that um uh, the eu is is pushing 
is aiming to halve pesticide use uh, uh, by 2030. Um, so there are changes kind of happening, but they're very slow and uh, too slow, really. Um, uh, people can support those the, the shift in farming by buying different foods. Um, so you could, we can all, you, even if you don't have a garden, you, you have an environmental impact through uh, your shopping choices. Um, and I mean, simplistically, but just as one example, if everybody bought organic food, there wouldn't be any pesticides in the world. Um, of course, it's easier said than done, and I'm I'm simplifying slightly. And not everybody can afford organic food, but um, it, it's it is it is true that our shopping choices have have implications. And if enough of us understood that, that could really drive changes in farming. So. Organic food to try and reduce pesticide use, uh, reduce meat consumption because basically meat isn't a particularly efficient way of feeding people. Um, buying local seasonal produce, eating more veg than anything else, all reduce our impact on on the planet. Um, and then there's other things we could do too. We could we could push for more environmental education in schools, more learning about nature in schools, so that the next generation don't grow up frightened of insects. That would really help i think and and as i mentioned earlier you know voting for politicians with the greenest policies whoever that might be in your country mm -hmm. if enough of us did then then I and mean, that would that the quickest way to change is through through government legislation um and and they could really push things along if if they saw the votes in it but at the moment i think a large proportion of of the voting population are not really engaged with environmental issues, particularly climate change has perhaps got people's attention, but but the biodiversity crisis, mm -hmm. I I don't think has really captured the attention of many of a large proportion of of the world's population. Most people don't think about these issues; they're completely oblivious of insect declines. They have no idea uh, what's happening, so they don't realise that their children are likely to have harder lives if we don't address these environmental problems. And, you know, we all love our kids and want them to have a good life. And if people understood that, I'm sure they'd do more, but they don't at the moment, um, which is frustrating. But uh, um, I, I shall keep banging away, trying to tell them and hope they listen. I understand your opinion and I understand the threat that we are facing. And I'm afraid from the opposite side that on our several topics, we are just leading to crossroads in T, uh, only two options, where to go very different options. And there is um, opinion that we really need pesticides to be able to feed the 8 billion of people living on the planet Earth. What do you think about that, that without pesticides, we will be in hunger? I I I don't I don't agree. Um, I I think that that misses the the huge inefficiency of the current system. You know, right now we we grow about three times as much food in terms of just raw calories. Um, there's there's about three times as much food as we need to feed the human population. Very crudely, nobody's starving because the, there's not enough food. They starve because they can't afford it because wealth is terribly unequally shared amongst us um and of all that food that's produced i mean approximately a third of all the food in the world goes to waste um mm. and another third is plants that are fed to animals to feed to people um uh which is just a hugely inefficient way um of feeding people um so if we ate a lot less meat um and significantly reduced food waste um, there'd be an awful lot more food for everybody. Um, and, and if you look at the the yields, there have been some big analyses and studies of data on the, the relative yields from organic farming versus conventional farming. And um, they, on average, they're about 80 to 90 percent. So they're lower, um, but not so much lower that if we address these other inefficiencies, we couldn't easily feed the world with organic. You couldn't do it overnight, obviously. Um, you know, it would take time to transition. But if we supported farmers into gradually shifting away from reliance on pesticides um, into regenerative farming of the kinds that I talked about earlier, 
then it, I think you know within five to ten years we could be we could be feeding the world without pesticides quite comfortably. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that we as a humankind are able to do this? I, I don't think we will do it, um, sadly, because I don't think mm -hmm. anybody really that, that any of the, the decision makers um, pre understand the, the, what's happening, the severity of, of, of the environmental crisis we face. Um, I mean, I, I try in Silent Earth to, to paint a picture of what the future will be like if we don't um, uh, address the... I mean, it's not just biodiversity loss, insect decline. It's not just climate change. It's, it's, it's those two things, plus a whole bunch of other things, like losing our soils, coral bleaching, over-harvesting of fish from the sea, pollution mm -hmm. of numerous... and so on and so on. The, the combined effects of those... I, are potentially devastating. I mean, I, it's perfectly plausible. You you sound like a bit of a nutter when you say this, but I think this this it's quite likely that civilization will collapse within the next hundred years as the environment unravels, um, and that future generations will have much harder lives than we do, unless we do something. Uh, and we could do it. it. You know, the human race is is amazing when it really puts its mind to something. We. Mm -hmm. We can turn it around, but the problem is we're not putting our mind to it. We're uh, pulling in different directions. We're arguing. We're blaming each other. Sort of, you see, growing isolationism amongst politicians nationally. Populism. Um, it's pretty terrifying, actually. We're doing exactly the wrong things. You know, instead of pulling together and organizing ourselves as a species to look after our home, we're mm -hmm. we're all going in different directions. Britain's left the European Union and, and and you know, America tried to build a wall between itself and Mexico and so on. It's, uh, we, we don't, it seems to me, seem to be going in the right direction, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, it commemorates me, or I remember when I have been talking with Jane Goodall, uh, she mentioned that uh, she was sure that there was a window of time to repair the world. And she is not sure, or as she told me, that the window is still open, but it's impossible to sit down and look around only. Uh, one must do anything uh, to try. And yeah. This is even the answer to the man you mentioned who asked about your psychic health. Just to do anything. This is the necessity to move, to not sit down and look around. Yeah, we I, I, we have to try, and, and I mean, as, as as Greta Thunberg said, I think not long ago, um, you know, gi giving up isn't an option anyway. Um, that will certainly lead to disaster. So, um, do what we can, uh, whether it will be enough, whether we, whether we have time left, I have no idea, um, but it's worth a try. The way how to try to do anything is. Uh... There is many ways how to do anything. And one way, for example, is just development of uh, small robots who can replace uh, uh, <laughs> bees uh, to help uh, fertilize uh, the flowers and the trees. This is your topic. You like this idea very much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh I, i i i fear that is the road to hell um, but, uh, so yeah but people are seriously suggesting this there are people building robot bees right now um uh, all around the world in japan in the uk uh in america um and i mean the, the notion as you say as well you know the, the People, these environmentalists tell us that the bees are disappearing. So what's the solution? Let's build little robots to pollinate all of our crops. The the practicalities, I think, are pretty formidable. Um, I mean, so pollination is done by lots of different insects. But if we just wanted to replace one of them, the honeybee, which is probably the single most important pollinator, there, there are something in the region of three trillion honeybees in the world. Um, so we're going to have to build a lot of robots just to replace that one species of pollinator. Um, and if you think about the, the the resources that would require, you know, the energy, the plastics, the rare metals, the batteries, um, the, the, the cost of doing so and, and of maintaining this vast fleet of tiny little bee drones or whatever you want to call them um, uh, would would be incredible um and then and so 
um, when you when you think we've got real bees that are really good at pollinating flowers, um, you know, they've been doing it for 120 million years. Um, they're biodegradable, they're safe, self-replicating, carbon neutral. They, you know, there's no downside to the real thing. Um, I, I, and so why do we think we can do better, you know, and, and surely it's going to cost more to build their replacements than to just look after the ones we've got. Um, uh, I mean, I sometimes joke as well that, you know, just imagine what could go wrong. There's, there was, I don't know if you have the television series Black Mirror, but there's one oh, yes. in that. Yeah. There's yeah. one episode there about um, robot bees, um, which which go wrong. Um, and, and you know, just imagine if, uh, you know, Vladimir Putin's computer hackers break into the bee robot control system or whatever and turn them against us. It just seems like a really ill thought out plan. And, and the final point to, to make on this is we're never going to build robots to pollinate wildflowers. Who's going to do that? Um, so if we if we lose the real bees and all the other pollinating insects, nothing is going to pollinate wildflowers, which means that 80 percent of the world's plant species, all the ones that re require insects, would disappear, um, which would be ecologically absolutely catastrophic. Um, so. You know, basically, um, we we need to look after uh, nature and stop thinking we can do better ourselves. Um, mm. I think that's completely bonkers. Uh, Professor Gulson, I have to ask you, so nicely you talk about uh, insects. Do you eat them? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't, uh, not routinely. I have eaten one or two. Um, I mean, I, you can make an argument, a pretty good argument, that they are that perhaps we should eat more insects. Um, in fact, I mean, lots of people do eat insects. It's normal to eat insects in, in a lot of Africa and Asia and South America. So we're actually the weird ones in in Europe and North America in not in not regularly eating insects. Um, uh, and if I, if I, I wouldn't advocate catching wild insects to eat. Um, oh. I don't think there's enough of them. But farming insects as an alternative to farming chickens or cows uh, makes quite a bit of sense um, mm -hmm. because they're much more efficient at turning plant material into, into nutritious animal proteins and fats than, than cows or chickens. And they need less water, less space and so on. Um, and arguably the... The 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 welfare issues are less as well because insects are presumably le have less capacity for suffering than cows or pigs rammed into crowded buildings or whatever. Um, but I, you could debate that one, I suppose. But anyway, you you, you can uh, they could be part of a sustainable future, I guess. Um, uh, mass culture of crickets or mealworms or soldier flies or whatever. Um, uh, but uh, it, it's going to be a hard sell to the public in Europe, I think. It, it would be pretty difficult. Uh, dear Dave, thank you very much for for this meeting. And Pleasure. I was thinking uh, what to give you uh, as a present, as my thanks uh, for the meeting. <laughs> and this is, I, I have for you a present. This is a short story. I have a friend from Sri Lanka. He is a monk. He's a Buddhist monk. And of course, he's not killing any creature. So neither, neither the insect. And I asked him, well, my friend, uh, it's pretty dangerous sometimes in your country because there's many uh, of uh, illnesses you can get just from uh, from the insect. What do you do if uh, any mosquito sits down on your hand? And he said, I let him to eat something, let, let he drink, and then he can go away by himself. It's all right. <laughs> and after some time, uh, my friend got a dengue fever. Which is just uh, <laughs> yeah. which he took from from a mosquito. So then I asked him again, "What do you do now with the with the insect with the mosquitoes?" And he said, "I let him sit down, and before he starts eat, I do foo foo go away, go away." <laughs> <laughs> so this is the story for you. <laughs> That's lovely. I, I I wish more people would hear that story. <laughs> Great. So thank you very much. And uh, I believe that sometimes in future world, you will find another time because I would like to talk just about the system of bees and honeybees, about the system of ants, which is a very interesting topic. And you have great materials about that. So can I ask you after maybe half a year, one year, will you find the time again?
Of course, I'd be happy to. Great. Thank you very much. Good All night. Right, take care. Uh, Have a good evening. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Thanks for listening till the end. Thanks for every like or subscription. And tell me, do you like insects at least a little bit more than you did an hour ago? See you next time. Peter.